buffer time. What? 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 what is buffer time? Is what? 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 Buffer, buff, buff, buffer time. Welcome back again, my buffer timers. We're here to talk about the thaw. Before that, we're going to get into a little bit of a discussion about what we saw this week in Strange New Worlds drops. Before that, we'll go around and introduce ourselves. I'm Dustin from Best of Track, Worst of Track. I'm Nathan from N Squared. I am Vanessa, and I host a YouTube channel called I Love Bad Star Trek. I'm Robbie of Conversations with Robbie Sherman, Six Seasons in a Podcast. And I am Scott of the YouTube channel Opinions No One Cares About. All right. To get us started today, we've seen a little bit of news, a new trailer for Strange New Worlds that has finally confirmed what we already knew. We're getting a crossover, amongst other things. So let's start right here, because I have recolored this picture to be more purple than it should be. Do you guys think Boimler's hair is purple enough? In this photo. <laughs> oh, yeah. This yeah. photo, absolutely. What about I, this one? Well, this is the original. I was gonna say that's the original. Yeah, uh, this is the original. It's more of a mauve, more of a you know muted dark aubergine versus the vivid purple before. Yeah, it I thought he was losing his hair with the job. brighter purple. <laughs> it, it works. It's just you know it's not purple enough. I think. Yeah, I, I don't think so. You can't expect live action to compete with a cartoon. That's that's the mistake Disney's been making for like 10, 15 years now. Why not? Why not? Yeah, wait till just... wait till I dye my hair. Like come back in a few months and we'll see. <laughs> Challenge accepted. They so can what color are it in color, you know? I think they probably should have gone with a wig for this one, but you know, that's okay. What is, yeah. what is the thing from the trailer that gets you guys the most excited for Strange New Worlds? What did we see that we loved? This was kind of it for me, but then I got a little worried. Um... Oh, gosh. <laughs> now, I was thinking of, like, there was something else that was coming out, and... Oh, uh, just skip me, please. Uh, well, I I really love the look of the Klingons in in this season. I went a lot into that on my own video, but I I adore this Klingon look in every way. They just nailed it. Though, for the record, I got I got I, I keep saying it. They have such an easy out in the makeup department. All they have to do is put some <laughs> Fu Manchu bushy eyebrows in there. Done. Mm -hmm. I mean, they. But I know, do like the look. It's very easy to do it good. But it takes, you have to know what you're doing to do it like amazingly and perfectly. I'm really excited to see how they're going to characterize Mariner in this thing, like how they're going to connect these two timelines. Or there has to be time travel involved, right? Because they're like in a oh, yeah. separate time period. And I really enjoy the uniform. They look great. They look great. Don't and uh, Mariner, just in general, like, how are they, how is her character going to translate to this, you know, like chaotic neutral alignment type mm -hmm. person with Pike? <laughs> so, yeah. I also wonder a lot about that. Like, are we going to have the same type of manic humor that we get yeah. in Lower Decks? Or are we going to be a little bit more subtle about this the way Strange New Worlds is? And Strange New Worlds can get goofy, but it doesn't get goofy like that. <laughs> you know? oh, See, this is how yeah. I think it's going to work. I think this is—I think it might all be ho holographic. Or so far, we've seen two pieces of a trailer that are in the transporter room. So more than likely, I think it's going to happen in the transporter. But if not, it's holodeck. It's badgy, and I hope we see live action goddamn badgy. I There's no I, way I, someone pitched modern these are the voyages and no one in the writer oh, no. stood up and said no, we're not doing it. There's no way that had happened. Live action right? peanut hamper, is that coming? <laughs> well, yeah, Actually, that does, that does, that does have a face. 
It could just be a floating sphere like well, those we've, new we've, Star Wars movies. We've got exocomps. They're already live action peanut handlers. Yeah. yeah. All right, before we move on to the thaw, is there anything else from the Strange New Worlds trailers that anybody would like to talk about? I did think of one thing I'm not entirely sure I like. It's uh, the return of Captain Kirk. Hmm. Um, I just kind of feel like, you know, we know this comes before TOS. We know Kirk will be the captain eventually. I don't think anybody needs that or uh, needs to be reminded of that. Because even like non Trekkies know Captain Kirk captains the Enterprise, so I don't know if it's absolutely necessary to have more episodes where you come back and like, oh yeah, this is a nice ship. I guess we'll be running it someday. No, see, here's the only thing that leads me to believe that maybe this will be a holodeck episode for lower decks, because in what we've seen for the trailer with Laan and uh, Kirk, it appears to be maybe that's going to be a time travel episode. So it might be stretched thin if. A ten episode season has two time travel I, episodes. I think that could actually be um, like one of the TOS plots where they visit a parallel world. Because there, if you look, there's things like very clearly Starfleet medical symbols on boxes, and there's also the massive alien ship. Um, so I could see it going either way. Actually, that's fair. The Enterprise doesn't have the Enterprise doesn't have a holodeck yet. Uh, it, it, the Cerritos does. Maybe. Yeah. T in TAS, it's shown to have one. So mm. whether it has one in Strange oh. New Worlds oh, time. That, yeah, well, that's the thing somewhere that in said there. was in canon. Discovery and then, has like, they, so. Discovery is also like a secret, super secret ship. So and that's we didn't like, see it have one until the 32nd world. century. I mean, so. the show, like they, right. they had some at the Academy, I think it was. Like they were much mm. smaller. Um, but Ash right. and someone but they did showed, like a shooting but, range. Yeah, but him and uh, in, in Enterprise, they run into it the first time in that one episode where a uh, mm -hmm. trip gets pregnant. Love it. Dubs. Yeah, they show oh, it for like they show the holodeck and they're like, "Ooh, yep. the reconstituted matter. What's that?" So they, it, it's not canon that holodecks exist in this time. They period. just don't That's get really good cool. until. I, yeah, uh, I agree. PNG. But mm -hmm. they've broken that rule before is kind of my point. Yeah. Yeah. That holodeck is what seals that episode for me, though. Right at the end when the Klingons are uh, looking at the Zyrelians technology and that Klingon captain's like, I can see my house from here. <laughs> the third possibility this is going to be working out is with black hole shenanigans. You know, they're probably going yeah, to sure, why not? a black hole, you know, and that'll be like the time travel device. I know it's still time travel, but it's not like the time travel we're going to expect, probably. I could see Mariner saying yeah. that too. Like, when I was like, how do we even get here? I don't know, black hole shenanigans or something. Roll that. Yep. Right. In the temporal prime directive, they're not supposed to really be time traveling to begin with, right? I really hope they do a thing where, like, they go from being cartoon characters into real life, like, people. Uh, I hope they, they find do. a way. Oh, they, okay. There's yep. a little section that's animated, at the very least. Oh, okay. And we don't know whether this means anything, but Anson Mount at one point had come out and saying that he had seen um, animated versions of himself. Whether that oh. means anything okay. or not, we don't know yet. They won't, but please, like, TAS Spock, the whole animated section. <laughs> no explanation. All right. Anything else in the in Strange New Worlds trailer? Nothing All right. About that then. trial? Yeah, I was going to leave that alone because I know two people here haven't even seen it. But I mean, we all we all knew it was coming that Una's gonna stay in trial. It's probably going to be the first episode. I thought I saw it was episode two actually, which surprised me because I've seen headlines about it. I thought I saw one that said okay. season two, episode two, Una's on trial. Which yeah, I was right. surprised. But um... interesting. Okay. Cool. Well, with that, I'm gonna turn the host chair over to Scott, and we are gonna talk about Killer Clowns. <laughs> yes, we are here today where I basically have to defend my enjoyment of this classic Voyager episode, The Thaw. Or, if you prefer, since I'm not able to use the ticker at the moment, Cirque de Soleil. That would have been much funnier if it was just scrolling by. 
Yeah. Okay, so this is um, you know a run of the mill season two episode. It's got some weird elements, some interesting ideas. Uh, you know, a lot of ruminations on the concept of fear. It's got this clown over here. Thank you. <laughs> um. Okay, so let's start off. Okay, so this yes, this is a cheesy, very campy episode. What would you say is the difference between? say, some of the scenes in this episode and that classic TOS episode, Plato's Stepchildren. Uh, I can start if if no one else Let's has do something. But Do it. Yeah, um, I Plato's Stepchildren is more foggy in my memory, of course. But I think um, yeah. in Voyager, in this episode, I thought that the kind of campiness... Um, is more to add to a oh god what's the word um the kind of like a disorientation for the viewer kind of like that feeling of something's not right um you know it, it's supposed to be kind of weird and disorienting and you don't know what's going on um mm -hmm. and that's why you know so many of the costumes that kind of can't yeah. be like crazy they're all out uh which i actually really like preferred to um, something like Discovery, where often when the, uh, the directors or writers try to make something disorienting, like when Burnham gets drugged with that truth serum at the start of season three, um, it's kind of like weird camera movements and things are disorienting. And it really takes me out of it usually when they do that. But this was one where it they didn't do any of that. It was just kind of like the weird, campy just like you don't know what's going on because it's all kind of absurd or surreal kind of feeling whereas then yeah Plato's stepchildren wasn't quite the same it was more you know um they're, they're kind of showing their power or yeah it's 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 not quite the same it's not a disorienting scene Plato's yeah. stepchildren for me is intensely more cruel than this episode ever is. Like people in this episode aren't being actively tortured necessarily in the same way. They're not being like mind controlled necessarily in the same way. Like we still have very cruel antagonists you know, in this episode, but compared to Plato's stepchildren, this actually feels a lot calmer and it doesn't, I don't know. It just doesn't feel as intense in its cruelty. I find that I very interesting considering this episode is one where people actually die. But oh, well, mm -hmm. that's true. Yeah, that is, that's a good point. I don't know. I, I see what you're saying, though. Like, having it be sort of mind control stuff, like someone's literally taking over your body, we're still, yeah. you know, comparing absolutely atrocious scenes. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'd, I'd kind of rather at least be in control of my body than and not yeah right. you know if i if i have the choice to like dance or choose in some other kind of merriment instead of being actually forced to do it immediately then that's that's better you know that's, <laughs> at least of the narrow margin of what applies is better there get in get in but yeah uh sorry vanessa i stepped over you there no it's okay I think that the differences in the scenes for me come uh, come down to consistency when it comes to worlds, like what the rules of the worlds are. I, I like with Plato's stepchildren, it was very clearly mind control from the beginning to end. It, yes, it was extremely cruel. Whereas with this, it's like, well, the people in the world are able to manifest things with their mind and then they choose to have someone that inspires fear in them and kills them, why don't they just think of something else? Why don't they literally think of anything else besides this horrible clown guy? Uh, and yeah, and why would they imagine themselves being murdered by a, a guillotine? That's weird. Now that sounds like an uh, analogy to anxiety to me. I mean, why can't you just wish anxiety away? Why do you have just to be so anxious better. all the time? Just go, yeah, it's all, it's in your head. But it literally Please. is in their head with this. That's <laughs> I, think the, I, I get it. Though at the same time, it's literally a manifestation blocking their attempts at it. So it's, it's kind of a meta mind 
jumble also. It's a weird one to get into it. Also, yeah, it, that, that, that's the thing. Like they like the, the but the thing is like their their world is a direct manifestation of everything they think. So they can just think of other shit and not have the clown there. <laughs> I, Whereas with like yeah, Plato's stepchildren, they have no there's no agency. There's nothing in the situation that is under their control at all. I don't think they have this direct is control um, is the thing. Like I Yeah, I feel like I they think, kind of like they all probably had fears, right? Um yeah. and it's kind of one of those things where like, you know, that fear it kind of grew and became more than the sum of its parts, boosted by AI. So uh, by the end, you know, they're trying to fight, you know, like a computer program. Like presumably they have to sleep at some point, right? The AI doesn't have to sleep. It can just, you know, keep growing and learning what they're afraid of and using it against them. Yes. I yeah, I guess like it would have been helpful for me to see like some sort of like, oh, this this software has taken a sentient turn. It's not just a mere reflection of everything. Like it's not just Sudoku for you know people that are asleep. This thing has taken a turn. And and it didn't. It's just, oh, the parameters are the same. It's just a lot harder to deal with now, but they don't explain why. fair yeah there's a lot of stuff in this episode where the guy can just manifest things out of thin air and we never like really have any explanation for why he's so powerful like other than the fact that he's a manifestation of their collective anxiety and i think that's part of what makes the episode feel weak in the idea that okay star trek is it has so much scientific basis behind it and all this junk but this episode is built around a meta like, sense of emotion that these people are sharing a collective fear that they won't wake up. And that's where I really get frustrated when I think about the plotting of it. And like, I enjoy it as an episode of performance and as an episode of creativity in a certain level. But I, mm -hmm. yeah, I think on a plotting level, it's a mess. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think fear really had a head start on them though too because uh, Vanessa, you mentioned this when you reviewed it. There's five of them. You know, how are they going to rebuild their society with five people? Well, that had to be lurking in the back of people's minds, and you know, the AI. I'm absolutely sure you know picked up on that and was expanding upon it. And all the little fears that nobody was like things that everybody knew but didn't want to say to each other until it just got I kinda, out of control. I wish it was more about that then the just yeah. it just seems so like random the things that they were afraid of like you know starting a civilization with five people like there's there's no mention of that there's no mention of like voyagers isolation from the rest of the federation there's no mention of that it's just sort of like well you had this fear as a child why don't we exploit that and it's just like why not like use fears that are that are situationally appropriate versus just random stuff well, I'm sure to fear itself, like all fear is equal, but yeah, that actually makes a lot of sense. Okay, so these aliens, I forget, did we ever get the name of their, I'm just going to say species, because, you know, there's like two of them left at this point? Yeah, I don't, I don't think, think so. so. Yeah, I yeah, actually did not pick up on that anywhere. I watched this like two or three hours ago and just didn't pick up on any such a mention. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, so these aliens have developed basically the Matrix technology, where they're all wired into a computer system to survive. Uh, Jane would mention that Starfleet had similar technology to this at some point. Um, she didn't say what happened to it. Was it. Is it possible that they discontinued it because something similar happened? I don't know, in the beta stage, maybe? I think what she's talking about is... Um... War, uh, early warp travel at like warp one, just the speed of really? light, were just yeah. above it, put people in stasis. And now that we've got warp eight, warp nine engines, and you can get to, you know, 10 star systems over in a matter of days, it's not as crucial to put people into stasis, I think is what she was getting at. Yeah, she's her exact line is years ago, which is kind of weird for talking about something that happened like 200 years ago, but it's not <laughs> wrong. Like it, but yeah, this technology doesn't really make sense like years ago. So I, 
I think it is kind of talking about like enterprise era stuff. It doesn't make it sound like it was an old concert or something that happened five years ago. <laughs> Like it sounds yeah. like you, you know that um, the first uh, season finale of TNG, where they found like human popsicles, in oh. like and it, they were like dead kind of, except for a couple people. It's kind of like yeah. that, where it's like these people were flinging themselves out into space and just sort of stuck themselves in the fridge until they got to where they were going. Um, but those folks in particular were from like mid 20th century. So right. Jenkins Pog. Um, yes. Is a more I was just modern thinking example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause he was literally in stasis. I was actually wondering if he would, had, had gone through something like this or no, no, that makes sense. Yeah. It's going to end up being really short. Um, Jenkins Pog would be a fun character to put with a clown like Michael McKean. <laughs> Jenga, ooh. Just in general, I, I want to see something with Michael McKean and, um, and oh God, what's his name? I can't. Jason Moustakis. I, I figured him and Jason Manzoukas probably have the same amount of money they go for, so they, they could bring him back. Can't be that hard. Oh, yeah. But okay, so yeah, we're speaking Michael McKeon as the clown. Just so awesome. Anyway, um, or if you prefer, fear. So is fear really as easy to conquer as tricking it into going away? Depends on the circumstances, I guess. Like, <laughs> I guess like in some cases, you probably could trick yourself into, slowly trick yourself into working away from a fear. Go ahead, Vanessa. Yeah, I mean, that kind of like, you know, further to what Dustin said, if you, if anxiety was just something you could think away, then you would, you know, so it kind of like contradicts itself, like, oh, it's out of control, but it's under Janeway's control. Like, which is it? Is it like this uncontrollable, like difficult primal thing to deal with that's part of our lizard brain? Or is it, you know, something that you can intellectualize and get around? You know, like, what is Janeway's fear? That's what I think this episode's missing. Like, what is it that she's afraid of? We never face that because by the time she meets fear, it's already over. I don't know I that I can answer that even. Permanently, but... Depends on the episode. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, yeah, I don't uh, actually... Know. It's unfortunate because she's super inconsistent written and i think that's a bummer about voyager in general um but I, I i that was the thing that i was looking forward to most in terms of like you know th like talking about fear is a, an opportunity to give insight into your own characters and we know that like harry kim's afraid of surgery like okay um you know uh and like yeah that's kind of it because he saw like people put down for like radiation burns and stuff when he was a kid. I didn't see that. I got. I don't intend to like you know march my kids through a burn ward, and I really hope they don't find their way into one by accident. <laughs> Never let them watch Grave of the Fireflies. Then. <laughs> <laughs> one of the, <laughs> must must suffer exactly that other picture you had up of him as an old man. I looked at that I was like, wait a minute, are they foreshadowing this? Because that's Harry Kim, you know, old star an old man in a Starfleet <laughs> uniform with one pip on his collar. And he he almost got promoted. Did you see? And I think it was Picard. He was supposed to show up, but it got cut. Uh, he was he almost uh, got his promotion, but uh, <laughs> it's not to be. Yeah, I was actually just watching um author author, like I mentioned. Um, and there's that scene where he's talking to his parents and they're like, why haven't you been promoted? You command the, you've been commanding the ship. Why haven't they promoted you? I'm, his mother's like, I'm going to write a letter to the captain. <laughs> Poor Harry. Uh, maybe, the, maybe you're why I haven't been promoted, Ma. <laughs> maybe you're why I haven't been promoted. <laughs> you, oh, all right? I, I, I wasn't watching you. Like, if they showed, like, Harry's fear of becoming old on Voyager as it relates to their voyage back, like, not making it necessarily.
necessarily just, I mean, I'm sure that a lot of the crew have that same anxiety that they can't really think themselves around. Like, I don't know. There's, there's just a lot of missed opportunity. I wanted to make sure we talk about the jazz clarinet that we started this episode out with. (laughs) The jazz flute, as you put it. Yes, I, I was wrong. I'm not good with woodwinds, okay? Give me a break. <laughs> you should put that on a t-shirt. <laughs> I'm not good with woodwinds. Man, we'd be, yeah, that's a great buffer time generic t-shirt. Yeah, we're, we're going to get our merch on that. We're going to have merch for you here soon. <laughs> You're right, by the way. He does years. put a switch to the saxophone at some point. Oh. Yep. What was it? I've I've had merch for years. It's a mug with my face on it and then Alex's <laughs> face on it. The I no, only, I, only I, two I, in existence, but you, they, you can technically still buy them. Huh. Are those your brand of like cat ear headphones? They are now. <laughs> <laughs> Gamer Girl by Nathan. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yeah, I know we don't have very many questions here, but is this Michael McKeon's best work? And if not, what is? I admit I came up with this question Ooh. and I still say no. Now I do need to look up everything he's done. Uh, it, it, yeah. it may not be the best thing he's done, but what I, I, mean, I think Dustin, what I'm going. Go ahead, sorry. Vanessa. Dustin, you brought up a point of like how Michael McKeon is usually like a background character, he's versus, always like, a supportive character. character. So mm-hmm. I really, I really love him in everything he's in. Honestly, equally, uh, he just kind of brightens mm-hmm. up whatever he's doing, and I love him so much in um, Clue. Personally, <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, yeah. Exactly. yep. Good stuff, Mr. Green. He's in, he's in the Clue. best damn line in that movie. <laughs> huh? I'm gonna go I home just... and sleep with my wife. <laughs> Oh, Not even that. My favorite that, is his, his, his opening. He's like, I have something to say. I'm not going to wait around for Wadsworth to expose me. I work for the State Department, and I'm homosexual. Myself. I love Clue. Please, okay. Well, I haven't been able to go through the entire Michael McKean filmography, but I have been going through Better Call Saul lately, and his performances in that are so incredible. Oh, if yeah. you're if yes. you're not watching if you're not watching Better Call Saul, get on it. It's one of the best dramas TV has produced in years. And he is so bitter and multifaceted in his hatred towards his brother. It's always always entertaining. Season I, one is amazing. Oh, yeah. I've skimmed yeah. his filmography, and between this and Short Circuit 2, this is definitely my favorite performance Ooh. of his. Oh. I don't watch a lot of movies, yeah, so yeah. those were the ones I recognize. Yeah, I, I'm not sure it's my it's just... favorite Michael McKean moment, but what I'm going to say is I think it might be the most pivotal thing that he ever inserted as an actor to make it better. Like almost everything that he's part of is pretty good on its own anyway. But in this one, he took a like lower middle of the road premise that really isn't that much better than what we were talking about earlier, like random TOS cheese. But you insert him and his sheer presence just elevates this episode 100%. This episode doesn't even feel like Star Trek to me. It feels like a Twilight Zone episode, especially that ending where it just kind of fades out. That's totally Twilight Zone material. And I I think it's really good to have a character actor like Michael McKean here, you know, to, to sell those moments because those moments would appear really goofy with a lesser actor. They're still a little goofy, but they're yeah. much more compelling having this guy in charge of them. Yeah. I would just say there's only one thing I can think of that I've seen him in that I didn't like, and that's not his fault because it was an ensemble thing. It was season 20 of Saturday Night Live. 1995 oh. was a bad year. Yeah. Yeah, bad year. Like even, I don't know if you guys know, they made Brady Bunch movies. Like movies about yeah. the Brady Bunch yep. back in the yeah, 90s. The 90s. Yeah, yeah, they're like good. The bad guy I remember. In the first one, he was even good in that, and that movie's terrible. 
Oh, I, I love those oh movies. Gosh. I think those are great, like, <laughs> examinations of the camp power the Brady Bunch had for a generation. Those uh, The Brady Bunch I was on it, in reruns for a long time. Sorry. Wasn't he also in um, in uh, Coneheads as, like, one of the detectives? Yes, that, that's also oh, one of my great. favorite movies. Love yeah. It. Wow. <laughs> Your taste I think that's the first so place. Cool. I think that's the first place I've ever, I ever saw Michael McKinn. If you're about to say my taste in movies yeah. sucks and you don't like Coneheads, that's a you problem, bro. I was going that's a to you say, problem. I was going to say is always fascinating, Dustin. Okay, you assuming that I'm going to put you down is a you problem, Dustin. <laughs> you remember it. Yeah. And then of course there's a Christopher Guest connection, but we don't have that kind of time. <laughs> we got all but, kinds of time, actually. We're only yeah, halfway we, we through this time. episode. <laughs> okay, fine. That's good. <laughs> Maybe this episode shouldn't be so thin. <laughs> I mean, that I've, is the problem with it. And true. like, I've, yeah. I've seen some people say it's the best episode of Voyager. You know, when Ooh, I was putting go together my that. list, I like, I almost wanted to believe that. But every time you watch it, you can tell, like, yeah, like half of it's filler. And if it wasn't helmed by Michael McKeon, it wouldn't get there. Yeah, the episode, like this episode after this that. is Tuvix. And like, surely that's <laughs> yes, <better. you're> right. <laughs> I, uh, I actually think the worst, like, pulp episode of Voyager is ten times better than this because I there's just more going on when they get pulpy in the show, and I would much rather have that kind of flavoring instead of, like, uh, Shakespearean nonsense, Fair. which is why I want to lump this in with, even though they don't, they don't exactly, like, have a ton of Shakespearean overtones throughout this. It's more just, like, medieval <laughs> shenanigans. <laughs> I, I think like uh, this was supposed to be inspired by Federico Fellini's Eight and a Half. Oh, okay. Which only has a very, I mean, like maybe in the visualish sense, but it's like there's there's yeah. reasons for the visual. It's not just we're just going to put people in clown outfits and make them dance around to make it odd. That's not right. really what Federico does. So I, I just. <laughs> I just thought like that just sounds like a like a really thin connection to me to make it seem more artsy and important. Beautiful ticker. <laughs> okay. Um, I would say final question, but I have one after this that I'll hit you guys with. So, can you think of a better ending to a Trek episode? Yes, you because want to score? I, I'm sure we all have well, I Wait, was about that? to actually. Um, say if we'd run out of questions i was gonna ask if what people thought about the ending because i it doesn't really work for me actually as much um i like jane the, the ending is kind of janeway's thing about fear exists to be conquered and i feel like that's that doesn't really seem right to me especially if we're talking from the context of like what does fear actually want like does janeway think the purpose of fear is to be afraid of the poisonous snake, but not tomorrow. It'll be okay tomorrow. Like, I think from fear's perspective, the purpose of fear is specifically to not be conquered. So it's kind of weird for Janeway to be like, well, you wanted to lose because you're fear. Like, you know, the whole point is to make the fear go away. And that, that felt really weird to me. I think this is like endemic of not having the episodes concretely connect with one another in a sequential manner. So it has to be conquered in this particular episode while like her entire journey back to the Alpha Quadrants is about facing fear over and over and over again. So it's sort of a non sequitur to me to end it this way. Like I said before, I think this is way more of a Twilight Zone episode, Twilight Zone premise, than I think it is a Trek premise. I think the end kind of pushes itself out with a false mysticism like we would see at the end of a Twilight Zone. Like, you, like we have an answer, but we don't really have an answer. And it, it's, it's just unsatisfying. Yeah, like it... It makes sense on a dramatic level, like to do this, like the lighting of it and the way they use the lighting, like that's a 
that's a cheap, effective way to end a TV show. <laughs> you don't have to worry but when about you, When you're a show that's got 800 episodes and you only do it once, it's okay. Yeah, okay. And I think I, it's done really freaking well. Yeah, you know, it yeah. looks good on a visual level. <laughs> I don't think the explanations that they give with it makes it the most compelling dramatic thing, but it definitely works on a visual level at least. Yeah, I, I really was, wanted. Yeah. Yep, go ahead. Please go. I, ahead. I just, I just really wanted to know more about Janeway in this moment, because it's just her and fear together. Like, wouldn't you talk about like how you maybe have struggled with this, or is it she's just facing it down, and that's all there is to it? Our uh, our listener Gannon says that he forgot how many episodes in season two are considered bad. This season had two this threshold and resolutions. And mm -hmm. he says he'd rather watch the season two finale where Riker has coma Ooh. flashbacks and then resolutions. I don't know about that, but yeah, that, that's the one I it is pretty it. bad. But I, I think this ending might have been better if Janeway, like you went in so it was only Janeway, and then she just wasn't afraid. And so fear went away because it's like it's a manifestation of what the people in the um, in the stasis are actually feeling. So if Janeway comes in and just isn't afraid of fear, like then it's an, more of an actual conquering and it might have worked better than like, oh, okay. I tricked you. <laughs> Bye. You know, at least out of all the characters in Star Trek, Janeway is the only one I can maybe buy that really she barely has any fear. I know in another I can't remember if it's this one or another episode where she talks about like the only thing she was afraid of as a kid or like thunderstorms on the on the plains, things like that. But like through the through the run of the show, she's just shown she is a badass, no fear captain. Or she f like yeah, faces this... it, but does things to manage it because she has a crew of like people that are probably just as scared as she is. And like, get, like keeping up morale is is definitely something that's like in the, a priority for someone in that position. I having her turn back that's and like explain that she conquered to fear, uh, it, it feels like a comic book move almost. You know, like oh well, we got this panel we got to figure out, so we're gonna write all this stuff in here to make this panel work but we don't really need that stuff if you're following the rules of the storytelling that we've already been laying down. And, and Janeway being such a like fearless character, you would think there would be something more exciting they could have done. <laughs> just, just something more. like Something's missing there. Can I also add that it to me it seems just like Janeway uh, to have a streak of sacrificing holographic Janeways? <laughs> yeah. I wonder now if I were to go back, how many times does this actually happen in Voyager? <laughs> Is it just the two? But that would rule if there was like a whole long complex thing where multiple AI Janeways get sacrificed and fear <laughs> keeps losing or something like that. I'd way really rather have that. Maybe oh my god, just now I want the, maybe that's where the lady on the protostar came from. One of the sacrificed. Million. Okay, that'd be intriguing. What were you gonna say, Dustin? I was gonna say now I want I just want fear to come back on uh, Prodigy. I, I, like, <laughs> I want Admiral D oh, Janeway oh. to have and the kids of the pro uh, well not the Proto Star anymore, kids. but I want Whoever them to have to deal with him. Jankum Pog and fear. I was thinking like you could probably bring him back. Like oh god yeah you know you could find a way yeah. They, they could be buddies be and torture people with each other. <laughs> oh, wow. To be fair, I, I would have much rather had Michael McKean as Fear be the villain in this past season of Picard than what we got. Yeah. But that's neither here nor there. <laughs> oh, gosh. I kind of wish okay, they so... used like, Fear in season two or something. That would have been more compelling on a certain level. <laughs> right. I'm sorry, Scott. Go ahead. <laughs> Okay, so what do we think are Trek episodes that have better endings? I don't know, like one each. Go around. 
there isn't one for me. I, I put that original question in here about who thinks it's better. I, I think this is the best ending in Trek. It's not the best episode, wow. but it is the best ending okay. for sure. For me. I think the way Workforce ends is a lot better than this. I actually had way more fun watching something like that than I do this. Because this all feels more like a pretentious use, <laughs> use of Star Trek time. And it feels like, it almost feels like watching a middle school play compared to what the rest of Star Trek can accomplish. Wow. In the pale moonlight. For oh. sure. I'm trying to remember that's, how it ends. Oh, yeah, that's when. Uh, I, yeah, so that would be the number two. Log. Yeah, he deletes his personal log. Oh, I mixed up. I mixed up the episodes. I was thinking uh, yeah. it's only a paper moon. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, oh. that that's something. Yeah, that's that's a yeah, different no, one. Right. But this one is like he he confesses to committing mm -hmm. assassination essentially, and I can't uh, with you know it. all the choices that led up to that point, and he wonders like, am I? Can I live with it? I think I can live with it. And then he deletes his personal log and that's it. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah. it, it tells you so much about who Cisco is as a character and so much about everybody he interacts with. Um, it was, it was just, I mean, D, DS9 to me is just the best. And that to me is the best of the best. So. Yeah. I mean, it's, as I said, this ending isn't great for me, so there's a lot that's better. I've, I've been trying to think of kind of what I'd consider the best, struggling to come up with, um, like just struggling to think of endings, really. But yeah, I mean, in, in it just the paper, to be better. I mean, it's only a paper moon as a good one. Um, like, I, I mean, a lot of Deep Space Nine, yeah. Um, but it, most, like, I, half the endings are probably better. I even prefer yeah. the ending to of two bits compared to this. Like I even prefer the ending oh. of that compared to this because that gives me like more moral ambiguity to chew on. Mm -hmm. It makes me think about what mm -hmm. these characters and their place on the ship are. Like I'd rather have something more like that than what I get in this episode. I feel my something. thoughts. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. With, with this, I'm like, that doesn't really make sense, but at least with two Vicks, I'm feeling something. Yeah. I kind of I go I got to go with the somewhat optimism of the TNG episode The Chase. Oh. Um you know, you got the whole thing with the progenitors they're like, yeah, we scattered, you know, seed all over the galaxy and you got all these these races now and most of them people are like, we're not we know nothing like these these friggin' idiots over here. But then at the end, you know, the la I think the very last scene is a conversation between Picard and the Romulan captain commander. And, you know, even like the Romulan was, okay, so maybe we're not so different. And I feel like it's a really hopeful step, you know, until like Nemesis comes along. Mm -hmm. I found it. It's, I um, love the, I, oh, what is it? All right, go ahead. Whatever the last one of the Klingon augment arc is in Enterprise is probably my favorite ending. Cause I, hmm. I say a lot, I love the res, like the solution Cheers. of the virus explaining TOS Klingons as much as it doesn't work now. <laughs> um, I I really liked that one, and I've always been so impressed by that. Like, you know, it, like it was always something that just never worked. It was weird, and then one writer was like, "I I can do it. Give me give me three parts." <laughs> I I love that they write. That they were like, crack? "We got yeah, yeah, to gotta write, gotta write something in canon that explains this completely banal thing, like the progenitor mm -hmm. thing. We just have these blank templates of aliens that we're just flinging around." And with the Klingons, they had a virus. I just think that's funny. Yeah. I love it when they pull it off, though. Right. <laughs> <sighs> okay, let's pull it back to this episode just to uh, to end it. What is, I don't know, let's say your overall review and ranking, whatever system you like, out of what, like... We usually do 10, but how, yeah, yes. like you said, however you want, however you want to do it. Mm -hmm. Oh, I I would probably be first. Um, yeah, I mean it's I I like I it's definitely it. enjoyable. Um, well, I was <laughs> just clockwise, but um, it like it loses me a bit at the end because there's some things that don't really work. But um, 
maybe like a seven. I don't know. We'll call it a middling. Okay. Literally, Vanessa. Okay. Uh, I would say, I would say it too because I don't agree with any of the choices Jingwei makes at all. Um, she's making taking risks for nothing, and <laughs> the defeat of fear is nonsensical. I love your explanation, like your docking points for Janeway, and that's just how I describe her, like <laughs> in Voyager. Yeah, you're not wrong. <laughs> yeah. And hi, Tanya, oh, really? with your six out of ten. I haven't I seen you in a while. Yeah. I want to give it. I want to give it a six out of ten, but I honestly think it deserves about five out of ten at the most because I think it is entertaining at moments. <laughs> I, th I think it has some like nice interaction with people going on. You know, people don't feel shift in this episode the way maybe some of the earlier season one episodes feel. We feel more like family here, you know. <laughs> and Voyager, your family. <laughs> And I, I also think like it has potential. I think the idea could be interesting, but we never quite pull it into something that I think is interesting. We don't give Janeway really interesting stuff to do because most of the episode she's a, she's walking around being like, "What can we do, IT people? What what can we do?" Not that I can actually do anything because I don't know how to work these pods or have any ability to actually do the technical stuff you guys do. But <laughs> so yeah, it all just feels like kind of a wash by the time you get to the end of it. Uh, all the performances are good. Michael McKean's a really excellent guest star. He definitely helps make the episode watchable in a way it wouldn't be otherwise. And he helps sell the ending as well as he can. It it feels like bad Trek and it feels like really bad Star <laughs> Twilight Zone stuff. So I just think it's kind of middling. Five out of ten. All right. Um I'm gonna I'm gonna go pretty high here. I'm gonna give it an eight, and it's all off the back of Michael McKeon. If this was say oh. Rob Schneider doing this role in this exact same script, no other changes, this would probably be a three, maybe less. Oh. But Michael McKeon, uh, I think only him and maybe Jim Carrey, but we didn't have the twenty million dollar budget to get him at the time, could pull this off. Yeah. And I, yeah, I'm, I'm sticking with an eight. I love it. I love that ending. I love Michael McKeon. <laughs> Plot could have been a little better. Go ahead, Scott. Okay. Honestly, I probably would have given this about a five, um, just to start. Because yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of fluff and filler. Some of this stuff doesn't make a lot of sense. Um. But if you look at it overall, this is the kind of plot that would have made a lot of sense, like as a TOS episode. I mean, like it makes sense that we're comparing it to Plato's stepchildren. And I feel like there are a bunch of episodes in season two, in particular, of Voyager, that kind of conform to that. This season started with them meeting Amelia Earhart. And then, you know, you've got Threshold, you've got Persistence of Vision, where Janeway's hollow characters are coming to life. Tuvix comes right after this, like we were saying. I kind of feel like, you know, this is the point where they're kind of, you know, reaching back to the kind of silliness of that for inspiration. And on top of that, I enjoy, well, Janeway's performance as a hologram at the end more than probably the rest of the episode. And I enjoy the doctor in this incarnation before he's really more of, more uh, evolved as a character because it suits him to be, you know, a no-nonsense hologram dealing with a hologram like this. But yes, as Dustin said, it is absolutely saved by Michael McKeon. Um, you know, we're talking about the whole cheesy, campy thing. Anytime anyone says camp, my mind immediately goes to Batman 66. And that is where I think uh, Michael McKeon was drawing his direct inspiration from. I'm sure you're right, Vanessa, that, you know, Fellini, uh, the Fellini film uh, Eight and a Half was an inspiration for the episode. But I absolutely feel like Michael McKeon himself was drawing inspiration from Frank Gorshin as the Riddler, 
who is, by the way, the best riddler, fight me. Um, he would go through any episode. He's in equal parts manic and depressive. I want to call him bipolar, but I'm not really good with the terms. Um, and I feel like that's exactly what Michael McKean was doing here, if only like a slightly watered down version, maybe just a little bit less energetic. And he pulls it off and it just, it makes the episode work for me, which is why I would elevate it from a five, a poor Dustin is to an eight. And I would also like to point out, Vanessa, that you did review this on your channel for good reason. But when Dustin has been ranking all these episodes, he put it in his top 200. Oh, number 160. So it's it's the solid eight. It is right at Sorry. number eight, the, the, the confluence of number eight. It's the definition of an eight. It is, actually. Yes. It's biggest mixed bag. I think that's right. I'm a really <laughs> I am really glad you mentioned eight and a half because I have completely slipped my mind and that makes so much sense with the very Italian clown <laughs> shenanigans we got going on here. Thank you. I think my score is probably being elevated like a point or so because um, I love, I think Voyager's like conference meetings are often my favorite and it's just been so long since I've seen one from that because I mean they're basically the same as like TNG and Deep Space Nine but the difference is by Voyager it's been like seven to 14 years and so they know like all the possible ways that they could solve this by like transporter shuttle like I don't know all the random things and we have enough understanding to where like there's more cohesion you can sort of say oh the the heisenberg compensator is a transporter like part of the transporter system and these things we know and so i i often love joke that voyagers um conference meetings at the start of an episode are basically a bullet point list of why all the easy solutions don't work and it's just a line you know like it takes a minute or two to get through but it means that finally i could be like okay i can just like sit back and enjoy this is why all the easy solutions don't work and it's often kind of hurts like early tng or some stuff like tos especially where i just watched the um the episode where like it's the evil within where like kirk gets split into two people and like sulu and all the everyone is trapped on a frozen planet because they can't beam them up well, the easy solution is to use the shuttles. <laughs> that we haven't that introduced Because they haven't written it yet. Yeah, <laughs> and Vo Voyager doesn't have that issue just because it's like they've been writing for so long. And so I, I think it's just nice for me to see that again. Yeah. That's fair. I do want to say I'm always happy to see Harry Kim and Tom Paris kind of hanging out for a minute, just giving each other shit, you know, <laughs> being buddies. Oh, that look on Tom's yeah. face, exactly. <laughs> so, just to kind of I fill in, I was gonna say, uh, to fill in time here, I had a question. What do you guys think about the surreal, just background of the episode overall? I think it's cool. I think it's, weird. <laughs> I, I think it feels like a set dresser thing. Like this is something <laughs> they could do that would be <laughs> easy, right? I, I think Alex would like to comment on this picture you've just thrown on screen. Okay. It somehow looks like a more drug-induced Wizard of Oz. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's a very good explanation of this. Yeah. This is my reaction to your reaction. Oh, the results that's, of the that's his reaction to your reaction. Oz. <laughs> yeah, that's accurate yeah. depiction of what happens when you mention the drug-induced Wizard of Oz. Glory. Yeah. I feel like they were just reusing <laughs> some kind of early 90s, like, <laughs> neon costumes from some really bad, cheesy 90s movies with all the goddamn neon. And they just threw it into yeah. this and called it a day. Just like back in the day in right. TOS, where they reused all the, sh the curtains and things they could find. The, the, the combination of, like, the geometric shapes and the muted colors. It's It's... And then the the background is really bright. It just doesn't like sit on the eye very well, if that makes sense. Like it's just not the most aesthetically pleasant thing. Like the guillotine is like this hot pink, and the clown is gray. Like it's yeah. it just doesn't. It it looks a little off, and I think that's supposed that's by design. Yeah, I, it feels I like some. Think... Uh, it... <laughs> Go ahead. 
I, I don't think it always works, but I think it yeah. usually adds to what I was saying at the start with like the disorientation and it's it's not supposed to be quite right. And yeah, I, I agree, right. Vanessa, it doesn't always work, especially kind of like right at the start, but I, I think it does add to it in at least a few places. It feels like comic book coloring to me of the time where they were using these really bright colors for garish things. <laughs> Our That's listener great. says it feels like an acid circus. So a circus. <laughs> where, dr <laughs> where, where drugs help. So is, um, is acid circus the name of a kiss record? Please remind me somebody. <laughs> Oh, it's it's gotta be a name for something. Sure. Okay. I, I called it. I called it the Festival of the Juggalos originally. <laughs> I know when I look at that background, I kind of think of like what Dustin was saying. Only more like it would have been like the backdrop to like a Saturday morning TV show that was like you know like the setting to host like a block of cartoons so this like in between a real the ghost show you have like interstitials with like cool yeah. kids doing stuff that's what you're saying <laughs> like, this could be though. like a real ghostbusters back backdrop oh my gosh <laughs> yes it does kind of have the feeling though of Maybe I'm misremembering Voyager, but feeling like a little under budget for the time. Oh, like it's Norman. a set that would have come more out of TOS. Nine than like 90 Norman. Star Trek. Nine out of ten. Do it, Norman. Do it. This is one man who's not afraid to live in public, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, well, I think that's about all I had for this episode. So. Yeah. This is one of the widest know. ranges we've ever had as a group, for sure. And this this is one of the most polarizing episodes of Star Trek. I've seen people that have literally said it's the worst episode of Star Trek, period, end of story. And people, like we've said it, during this, that think it's the best episode of Voyager. Um, like and we're all somewhere in between. Yeah. Like, I wouldn't I think there's, think it's the worst. I think that's probably a lot about, like, maybe what what you want from an episode or how like what kind of things you'd interpret and, and how you'd interpret this episode because like you know a lot Vanessa a lot of your complaints at the beginning are like yeah you know you're right I just I interpreted this bit differently or like I I don't know it's like ah, I disagree it's not a problem for me so I think it's one of those things where it'll depend a lot on like what's a problem for you and what's not how you interpret a specific line um and that's why it's got such a big range. Before Fair we enough. go, I'd like to mention the other greatest Riddler, Jim Rash, <laughs> just for your <laughs> uh, uh, opinion, <laughs> Scott. He's a, he's a truly great Riddler. He's on that Harley Quinn TV show. It's awesome. Ah. No. This is the third time that we've talked about 60s uh, Batman on the show and every time I think uh, I have this thought and I've never brought it up we missed out on getting Burgess Meredith into Star Trek yeah we how did Burgess we Meredith that? as the Penguin is like he's my favorite uh, Batman villain and he would have been great oh, in Trek like TOS at some point <laughs> anyway so Vanessa what are we talking about next week the outcast. That's the one about an outcast, right? Yeah, it's a happens to be about somebody who's cast out and uh, brought back into the fold. Oh, it's a very oh, okay. Um, so they don't it, even it they don't even stay an outcast. They're just the outcast <laughs> for like five minutes, and then they just come yeah. back. Hey, guys, sorry. Is the placement it's, of it's the rainbow in that thumbnail intentional? <laughs> No, like the no? thing is, that's yeah. what's so interesting about this episode is that its message is completely unintentional. That's the weird mm -hmm. thing about it. And that's why mm -hmm. I really enjoy it. Um, and I, it was one of the first episodes that I was introduced to in TNG. And it's what got me hooked on Star Trek in general. So I'm really excited to talk about it. Has a lot of high, a couple of low points. I can't wait yes. to get into it. <laughs> 
So yeah. thanks for picking it. And we'll get on to that next week. Thank you, Scott, for picking the thaw and hosting that this week. And to all the other really? co-hosts for joining us. It's been a fun topic. This is uh this has really been a polarizing episode today, and it's been a lot of fun to talk about. <laughs> So thank all of you and thank everybody who has come and watched. We've had quite a few drop-ins here and uh, a lot of chatter. And we will see you next Sunday at 2 p.m. Eastern here on Buffer Time. Until then, live long, maybe pro.